start. Uh, I'm Professor James Genova, the Program Coordinator for History and Film Studies on the Marion campus. My areas of specialization are modern African history, an emphasis on West Africa, uh, European history, world history. Uh, I teach classes pretty much across the curriculum, uh, just about every geographic space. I haven't ventured into Latin America yet, but yeah, <laughs> I'm sure that's not too far around, but I teach all the war classes. Well, most of the war classes, Margaret, I think you probably teach Civil War and the American Revolution, um, but at least you know World War I, World War II, Vietnam War, et cetera. Uh, my areas of interest are film, uh, so that hence the film studies. I work on African cinema, uh, published two books so far. The last one was on the origins of African cinema. I have a third book that is in process and is just about to go into production uh, on Burkina Faso in the 1980s. Uh, that's a country in West Africa and a fourth book underway on revolutionary films from the 60s to the 80s in West Africa uh, that I'll be working on over the next year or two. Uh, so I'll pass that off to my colleague, Margaret. Uh, I'm Margaret Sumner and I uh, I'm the early Americanist on campus, so I teach uh, courses that range from um, early colonial North America all the way up to, as uh, Jim was saying, the Civil War is really my time period. My field is really the early American Republic, although I also teach courses on the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era as well. Um, uh, classes on 19th century social reform as well as the survey in American women's history, which I like to call sort of from Pocahontas to Pelosi in, in 15 weeks, um, just sort of a general survey. And I also teach our historical methods course, which is a required, a required course for our history majors that really um, takes uh, you know, a good semester to focus on uh, the history of history and sort of all the different skills needed uh, to follow the discipline of being a historian, um, a little bit more of a hands-on course um, with practical skills. Uh, rather than sort of, um, you know, sort of more of these sort of intellectual, uh, only intellectual courses. So we do a lot of discussing about skills as well as the various historical approaches that historians take to their subjects. Um, I um, specialize in the early American Republic and I'm interested in educational and intellectual history. And my first book it was called Collegiate Republic, which is on the sort of uh, early lives of the first set of national uh, early national colleges in uh, American history, any of the colleges that are founded after the American Revolution. And I did an intellectual and social history of the actual people who created those college communities out on sort of the frontier of America. My second book is uh, focusing on, uh, again, intellectual networks um, and thinking about sort of the way that um, uh, Black, uh, women scholars um, in this uh, sort of antebellum period started creating an intellectual world around uh, Black colleges um, just before the Re uh, Civil War and then after the Civil War and the expansion of sort of Black intellectual thought through sort of um, women's activities and women's uh, organizations. All right, I'll pass it and off to Amanda. I'm Amanda Respis, and I teach pre-modern world history at the Marion campus. Uh, the courses that I teach so far have ranged from a thematic survey of pre-modern history going all the way from the Stone Age to 1750. Um, I'm teaching some courses right now about the trade routes uh, along the Silk Road and the Indian Ocean uh, Maritime Silk Road. So my own research is very uh, caught up in the exchange of commodities and medicines across the Indian Ocean world. Uh, my research background is in anthropology and history. So I love to combine uh, textual sources and artifacts in class when I'm working with students. And uh, a lot of the projects that I have students do combine the use of artifacts and texts together. Um, and this is my first year here at Marion. So I'll talk a little bit about the, the major uh, on the Marion campus. 
Uh, we are fully part of the history department, so it is the exact same curriculum regardless of which campus you're on, Marion, Columbus, uh, Lima, Newark, Mansfield, does not matter. Uh, we offer the entire major on the Marion campus, so you can complete your major program, four-year program uh, from start to finish. Uh, we teach uh, actually most of the concentrations that are listed if you go to the history department's website, and there are a series of concentrations where students can kind of cluster their courses together and, and uh, concentrate in uh, non-Western history, Asian history, African history, European, American history, Latin American history. And then there are thematic uh, concentrations around culture and gender, uh, conflict, things of that nature. And we actually uh, teach most of those concentrations. Uh, we, we have enough course offerings and, and the breadth of course offerings where uh, you can actually pursue most of those clusters uh, on the Marion campus in their entirety in a four-year program. Um, Margaret does teach our gateway courses, we call it the History 28, 2800 Methods class, which is required of all history majors. There are only a few courses that are actually required that everyone has to take. 2800 is one of those. Uh, and that's, you know, teaches you the nuts and bolts of kind of what it is to actually write history, uh, to do history, to write history, what it is. Uh, and then there are senior seminars that all of us teach uh, and students are required to take two senior seminars at the 4,000 level. You can take them in your junior or senior year. Uh, we call them senior seminars because they're kind of meant to be the end of your program. Uh, and they are research and writing seminars where you really uh, work on a project of your own design uh, with guidance from uh, one of us. Uh, around a particular theme that we happen to be teaching that semester. Uh, and so over the course of 15 weeks, you'll get a, a uh, accustomed to the historiography, some of the basic literature of the area that you're interested in, what scholars have worked on, formulate your project, and then produce a major paper um, where you'll do some original research and, and integrate that with uh, some of the ideas that you encountered in the historiography. Beyond that, the program is, is pretty open. I mean, there are these divisions. Uh, pre and post 1750. So there are a certain number of courses that you'll have to take uh, that fit before 1750 in a time period and others that you'll have to take post 1750. And then there is uh, the division between Western and non-Western history. These are really archaic uh, divisions uh, that, that, you know, as historians, you know, we know when, when these things emerged uh, in, in a specific historic context and we've not been able to get beyond them, but that, so that's the, so it kind of seems, well, why 1750? Why, you know, why is that the division? But, you know, uh, there's no good answer for that. Uh, and so, so it just is. Uh, and so, you know, so any mix of that, but you, you know, we have the coverage on this campus to uh, make sure that all of those requirements, no matter how you want to configure them can be made, uh, whether through geography, theme, time period, uh, and certainly all the required courses. Uh, so I'll, I'll pass it now to Margaret, who will uh, give us a bit more insight into uh, some of the experiences our students have had and some of the projects she's been involved in. Yeah, I'm going to share a screen here. Let's hope it works um, and show you a bit here. Oops. <clears throat> Going to work for me? Yes. Um, along with the courses that you take in the classroom on the Marion campus, I wanted to just talk a little bit about some of the other uh, experiences that you could have as a history major. Um, and you could be uh, other majors as well. You're certainly open to, to working um, on uh, this sort of internship uh, activity as well. And we've had some people who are hi history minors that are interested in doing this as well. Um, we talk a lot about internships. You hear about internships all the time. These are um, really classes, extra classes that you take that were, are counted towards your history major. And so you would, if you're interested in doing uh, an internship, we have uh, agreements um, and relationships with both the Delaware County Historical Society up on top there, a little lovely um, brick building um, with their reading room and library off the back. And then um, the former Carnegie Library down in Marion, which is the Marion County Historical Society. And um, we've had students work there. Often students will take time in the summer to do an internship, but I've had students do them in the spring and fall semesters as well. Um, you sign up for a, you know, a, 
registered uh, internship class. You work with me or one of the other faculty here where you're um, you know, visiting with that faculty member two or three times over that semester or summer, but most of the time you are, you are working at the actual site and you get a chance to work with the staff. You get to see behind the scenes of what's going on at a historical society. And what I am always interested in having my history majors do is to start targeting on some particular interesting project that they really want to make their own at the his, whatever historical society they're at. And again, just to give you examples of what the last couple of projects have been that uh, that st uh, undergraduate students who signed up for internships, you know, you'll go there, maybe you'll answer the phones, you'll help them out with paperwork, you'll learn how to catalog objects, you'll learn again sort of how to put together exhibits and assist on that. But there's always one place where one moment there where students find a project that they really want to work on. So you can see examples here. Of, stu uh, of a student who um, transcribed a whole set of letters by a German American family who was living in Marion in the 1850s. Someone donated this, no one had ever looked at it, and she really got a chance to get in there and do some research on a local uh, immigrant family. Um, uh, another fashion a fashionista student who loved clothing, so she ended up hitting the mother load. Someone had donated a huge collection of mid-century modern designer clothes to the Marian Historical Society, so she got a chance to go through all that, catalog it, do research on big designers in the 1950s and 60s. Um, uh, another student who had been in my methods course had been really interested in 20th century masculinity and how men, you know, learned to be men. Uh, when he went off to work at the Delaware, Ohio uh, uh, Historical Society, they turned up a diary of a young sort of farm boy from Ohio that went off to be a, a soldier in World War I. And he spent uh, a good part of his summer transcribing this diary um, and just getting obsessed with this guy and learning all he could about him. And then another student recently did a really interesting almost genealogy of a number of black families who worked for the Ohio Wesleyan University in Delaware in the 1800s. Many of them freed slaves who had come up from the South and had landed jobs in Delaware. Um, and she tried to sort of trace out their families, track them, kind of get them recorded, and ended up on the phone with descendants of them. So she just did this really interesting project. Um, you get out there in the community with an internship, you meet museum professionals, you get a chance to, again, as Jim was saying, find your own project and make it your own and really learn to be a working professional, working historical professional in this, in this situation. Um, it's something that you take for credit, uh, you know, as just an extra class, um, and it's part of this history major. And we're always trying to find other institutions where our majors can um, do internships. Um, examples, uh, Jim also mentioned those 4,000 lev 4, level um, seminar classes. Again, to give you an idea, are some of the projects that students worked on. Um, specifically, what are some things that, you know, some of our most recent history majors worked on with, in, in this case, it was um, my 4,000 levels and Jim's 4,000 level courses. Um, again, some of these things, as you can see, number three, one of my students took her work on those Marian um, family letters and took all that work and did a whole much larger project uh, much, much later as a senior on German immigrants in general and used that collection as sort of the basis of her project. Um, you know, we have everything from Cold War topics, uh, Jim's uh, Revolutions Around the World um, project, all these students um, had worked on these as individual seminar papers, or some of them, uh, they even turned into an undergraduate thesis, which is an even larger research-oriented project that you take about three semesters to do in your sort of junior to senior year, and then you write it, and then you defend it, uh, just in some sense like a doctoral program, a, do a doctoral thesis. Um, you defend it in front of um, a mixture of um, faculty at OSU Marion, and then you graduate with research distinction on your diploma if you do if you choose to do a thesis. It's not mandatory, but it's something that, as I as you can see, some students um, really get into. And if they find a project they love, um, they can do um, a lot of lot of really independent research. And this is something that you know they love to do. We've got students that really get into it. Uh, we support that. We support that OSU Marion um, and the administration is really, really interested in supporting undergraduates in their research. So they'll, 
you know, pay to you have students working in science labs on campus, but we also um, can have our history majors apply through the dean's office through our undergraduate research and honors program for travel grants. So for one of my students who was interested in looking at um, the situation um, on, in, in plantation records, looking at slave mistresses and sort of their relationship to slaves, um, in through one of my women's history uh, classes, she received money to actually travel to Kentucky, which is our closest slave state in this time period, um, and did all of this visiting and talking with archivists and pulling out all these collections and taking a look at it. And I told her when she went there to give me an action shot, and there she gave me of her actively looking <laughs> at a at an eight. I think it was an 1810s um, and some some sort of I think it was a diary of 1810 plantation mistress and and her uh you know life on the plantation uh she was supported uh with a car rental with hotel stay and some spending money uh, for food uh, just like any other scholar so this is something that osu marion is is very happy to do and willing to do to students that really want to commit to a large undergraduate project and then i, I always like to say she was so sick of reading about these plantation <laughs> records and dealing with slavery that she hit the Underground Railroad Museum in Cincinnati on the way home just to sort of feel better about the whole situation. It was a rough project sitting around reading uh, slave masters letters, as you can imagine. Um, finally, um, we also offer, beginning to offer more and more um, service learning courses from the history department, although many other um, majors on campus, psychology and English also offer this distinct brand of a class called service learning. And pretty much what it is, is that the classes run in community, in partnership with a, a community organization. Um, so um, you're researching local history or you're doing some sort of research that's going to help some particular, um, you know, entity out there in the community. Um, and then you sort of share your research with them or share your, you know, what your findings are. So our, I took the um, U.S. Women's History Survey that we teach every sp spring, and I am in currently in community partnership with the Marion Women's Club. You can see the Women's Club home, their headquarters up there on the right. Um, they are deeply interested in obviously getting much more involved in uh, getting younger people interested, younger girls interested in the Women's Club, as well as getting just young people involved in sort of civic um, organizations. Um, especially students from Marion, but any any students would be, you know, completely welcome. I created a class that's um, based uh, on the theme of women's activism. And what students are doing is that they're splitting the time in this service learning class, taking half the semester and staying in the classroom and learning your typical, you know, history, US history, reading uh, primary documents, discussing what historians have to say about how women became activists in the nation. And then they are heading to the third floor of the uh, women's club home, the headquarters, and getting a chance to access the club records, which have been saved all the way back since the 1890s in what my students called the secret magical closet. All of these records were just stashed in this closet. Students got a chance to pull them all out, take a look at them. Here's some, again, history action shots of students doing exactly that from this spring. Uh, taking a look at scrapbooks that women put together about their organization, newspaper articles, photos. And this course is a place where students are learning, obviously, about women's history and American history, but also finding all kinds of stories about what's going on in Marion in the early 20th century as well. So you can see this list of all of these sort of um, ideas that, that the students started brainstorming as they organized their own research projects around these themes. And what I love about these service learning courses are they're 2000 level courses. So you don't need to be history majors. They're open to sort of everyone. Uh, certainly I have lots of freshmen and sophomores in this class. Um, and they're just sort of a really interesting way to sort of meet fellow students, um, but at the same time, you know, learn a little bit about the particular discipline. And, you know, I said, just have a good time. Students really got a chance, um, an opportunity that you don't often have to sort of take a look at scrapbooks and hold them and play around with them from the 1890s, the 1910s. Um, 
ultimately, uh, this is sort of uh, my, my take on this for the parents of our audiences, that not only are students learning intellectual information about American history, but they're also really learning about sort of real life skills, right? This idea of planning your own project. Each one of those students got together and had their own individual project that they ultimately was presented to the public, to the club and to the public at some point about their discoveries. Obviously, research strategizing, um, archival protocols. You can see them all wearing their little blue gloves there. We always joked it looked like CSI Marion. Um, but, you know, this idea of wearing gloves, not bringing, you know, food and water anywhere near historical documents. There's a certain sense of behavior you have in an archive. And we created that whole little world for them upstairs on the third floor of the women's club, um, just to give them a sense of, you know, uh, what it would be like to actually go to an actual archive or a, a reading room at a library. They have a little, you've got a dress rehearsal for that now. And I had plenty of the students actually do this work and then head off to the Ohio History Center to do research or go to the Marian Historical Society, you know, after they did this. Also very important collegial discussion. You can see them sitting around chatting with each other there um, as a group of historians together, talking to each other and um, bouncing ideas off each other. And of course, since they were all looking at the same sources, um, they all knew what everyone was studying and they helped each other out trying to say, I might want to take a look at that scrapbook or this scrapbook. Um, and then of course, public speaking as well. Uh, many of the students uh, were freshmen, maybe they're scared of speaking, um, talking out loud in front of others. Um, they, I, they, and they always warned me in the beginning, they're really scared about talking in front of people, they had social anxiety. By the end of the semester, they're experts, um, and they have plenty to say because they did all those discoveries. Um, so it's, again, it's sort of this really, really great experience. Service learning courses are definitely something to keep an eye out when you're starting to look at your freshman and sophomore year, um, because those courses are very hands-on and they're also very sort of outward facing as well. And you get a chance to meet and to network with lots of folks in the community. And the history department has the women's history class and hopefully we'll have a couple more to offer in the future. Um, that's a quote from one of my students. They got a little obsessed <laughs> with that. They're dreaming of the scrapbooks in their sleep, right? So just, I had a couple of quotes from my students about this. I loved it. So finally, some of our graduates, um, as well as you join or you think about joining being history major or a history minor, that's always an option as well. You're still part of the OSU Marion History Network um, if you're even a minor. Um, we have a whole gang of folks out there in the, in the county and <laughs> the surrounding community um, that have gone through our program. Um, on the left is a student, Kylie, who just graduated a couple of years ago, who, um, you know, won a prestigious early American material cultures uh, fellowship um, at a museum called Historic Deerfield. Um, yes, that is an actual piece of Paul Revere silver that she's holding there. <laughs> and she sent that photo to me and we both geeked out over it. Um, and she just finished up a master's in archival management and she's now on her way to running her own uh, genealogist service as well and doing consulting right now. Middle of this pandemic, she's still looking for a, 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 a um, permanent job, but she's cobbled together about four of them and she's doing really well right now. I don't know if she will actually look for a sort of committed permanent job because she's got a whole bunch of different things going on through the community. In the middle, we have a student, um, Quinn, who's, uh, who graduated and is now working on his master's in education. And again, uh, I, think, I think Jim was talking about sort of some of the awards at the end of the semester. Quinn was one of our award-winning students who I think had the highest GPA. We would expect that of a student who's going to be a teacher one day. There's his action shot with his great orange tie. Um, and uh, he's already deeply involved as a coach and he's a recently elected school board member in his community. So we have students that have connections <laughs> and are deeply rooted into their community and wanna stay here. And so that's really helpful as history majors because we can sort of bring them in after they've graduated. Kylie has come to my methods course a number of times. Um, and so will Quinn once he's out teaching to talk to current majors. Our last one, is a student named Gretchen who graduated, oh my gosh, about five or six years ago. And I just got word that she won the um, this year's Educator of Distinction Award from her high school, which is out near Springfield. And she was nominated by our high school students. And she did a great job in our methods class and in many, many other American history classes, really committed, absolutely obsessed with the Civil War. 
Um, and she's uh, right now uh, getting involved in having her students do um, mock trial and mock debate and really get involved in um, constitutional history. So that's sort of something that she's been doing and the students love it. Uh, she's getting them sort of into hands-on uh, you know, history in the same way that she learned it here at OSU Marion. And as you can see, I love that little picture of her student there. Um, you know, she's a, a big favorite there um, in, you know, social studies education. So just to give you an idea of sort of some of what our students are doing as they leave our classrooms and head out <laughs> into the big world with their history majors. That's it. I think I will stop the share. Okay. Amanda, did you want to add anything? I mean, you're, you're brand new uh, among us. <laughs> Actually, I would love to. I just very briefly, but I think it's also helpful to know how doable history research is during the pandemic. Um, I know it can be intimidating to think about going to archives just right now. It will get better. Uh, but there are so many great archives available online. And so right now, I think we're all experiencing our students navigating those archives, finding them, um, for pre-modern history, we have travel narratives and port records that are in English translation that are available online. Um, and I've had students work with uh, material objects that they put together with these texts like shipwreck artifacts, ancient coins, um, this semester even looking at the dental plaque on the teeth of merchants that have been recovered from the Silk Road. So, there are a million ways you can approach your research creatively, um, even during COVID. So that's really not an obstacle. Well, and uh, since we're talking about archives and archival experience, I'll uh, show a few uh, slides of some of the places that, that I work. Uh, I don't think any of our students uh, have actually made it over <laughs> to these places, but uh, certainly when we're thinking archives, uh, you know, we go beyond just the local archives, beyond uh, just what's available online. And there is the possibility for, you know, summer funding for other kinds of sources of funding that might enable uh, overseas travel. Uh, so I'll share this here. For a so these are the primary areas where, where I do my own uh, research in, in West Africa and in France. Um, in France, working uh, primarily in, Fran in Paris and in, in southern France, where the colonial archives, uh, and then uh, again in West Africa. So uh, you can be very imaginative with the kinds of projects. And you know, since we have all of these courses available and we teach seminars on them, uh, certainly there's the possibility of developing projects. Uh, you know, we have ways of putting you in contact with researchers, with places where you can get documents and materials from around the world, not just. Uh, within the United States or, or locally, you know, so we can we can really dream uh, globally. Uh, these are some of the images of, of the archives. This is uh, in Dakar, Senegal, uh, in West Africa, uh, and Ouagadougou. Uh, these are some of the French archives, uh, the Pompidou Center uh, off to the left, the colonial archives, uh, and then the film archives where I, I do a lot of the research on uh, film. So. So that sort of gives you a sense of, you know, some of the places where, uh, where I do research and, you know, if you're ever able to get there, if we're allowed to travel ever again, <laughs> this is what some of that uh, looks like. Uh, so, uh, so I'll go ahead and take that down. So, uh, yeah, Margaret did mention that we also offer prizes, uh, you know, for uh, best papers uh, at a lower level course, best papers at upper level courses and our overall majors, which uh, tend to go to seniors because there, there's a certain requirement of a class standing and number of credit hours taken in history. Uh, so they tend to be seniors, but the papers can be won uh, from the moment you walk in the door from your very first class uh, at any level. Uh, and, you know, we, uh, we submit them, we nominate them from our classes and have conversations among ourselves as to which ones we think are, uh, are the best and vote on them. Uh, and these are uh, prizes that do come with some cash, not an exorbitant amount of cash, but <laughs> at least some uh, at, at the end of a semester. And plus, it's a very nice recognition of an accomplished piece of work. Uh, and it gives us a chance also to look at the variety of the work that our students are doing and the quality of the work that is produced. And it really is quite uh, remarkable. So uh, 
did uh, Margaret or, or Amanda, do you have anything more to add? Um, I think you would you talk a little bit about the minor too, because that's always an option. I find that I have a lot of students that, you know, really, you know, want to go into nursing or want to be a social worker, but, you know, our minor is a little bit easier to sort of pull off, right? Yeah, yeah the minor really, it's almost an accidental minor. Uh, what we found is that, that students often wind up with a minor not realizing that they actually yeah. did the minor because <laughs> Uh, I believe it's it's only three courses. Uh, I think it's nine credit hours in history. Uh, there are no requirements like the 2800 or the 4000 level seminar. So there's no core course requirements. Uh, and so, you know, you have an option of pursuing a minor. You can do it intentionally too. It doesn't have to be an accidental minor. You can mm -hmm. <laughs> decide that you want a, a minor in history uh, mm -hmm. and you can double major as well. I mean, majoring mm -hmm. in history does not preclude majoring in other disciplines as well. Uh, and vice versa. And so we do have a number of double majors. We have uh, some who are history majors and minor in other fields, some who are majors in English or biology and minor in history. Uh, so there are any number of ways uh, that you can uh, engage with the history program and kind of you know, pick from our range of courses that we offer on the Marion mm -hmm. campus, which I think is really quite extensive. I, I think it's a, it's a remarkable and unique environment on the Marion campus to have this range of interest and expertise and the ability to offer uh, such a wide variety of courses uh, at every level uh, so that you know you're never stuck uh, you know with the same courses being offered over and over again and, and not having an option to really just kind of pursue an interest that may develop over time and then then you really get interested in something you know that you have the opportunity on the Marion campus to to pursue that as far as you want to pursue it. Uh, because we do have the resources among the three of us to to really help you with that and, and guide you. And I think too, speaking about that double major, um, one of the my student that headed off to um, Kentucky to do research, she was a double major in English and history. And being a double major um, it certainly is a huge time commitment. But when it comes to sort of helping to organize it, it's important to sort of know that at the Marion campus, all of the professors are tend to be in the same hallway, <laughs> you know, and there's a lot of conversation and um, connection uh, between faculty so that, you know, for my student Katie, who is a history major and an English major, she was working with two faculty members, two faculty, uh, you know, two professors to work on her thesis together about this uh, ultimately a temperance worker that she ended up writing her thesis on. Um, but, you know, she was able to come talk to me and do an hour of conversation, uh, get some reading from me, and then, you know, go down the hallway and talk to my colleague, Sarah Crosby, and we would get together and have conversations together. This is, of course, before the pandemic. But, um, you know, once everything is sort of hopefully back to normal, there's a nice sort of flow, um, a, a collegial flow at the Marion campus. All the faculty talk to each other. We are no, not divided by discipline. So that, you know, for example, I have, a, I have a student in my methods class this semester who's a sociology major. And he's loving the class, but he's doing it through the sociological framework. And so I've been, we've been laughing because I'm trying to make him a historian, right, for at least 15 weeks. Um, but, you know, I know who his, you know, his, his sociology professors were. So we've been having these conversations back and forth and, and he's been in on it, right? So I, I do feel that when it comes to how we're, we're trying to uh, talk to these, uh, talk to um, our, our history majors and our sort of undergraduates, we really want them to join that sort of conversation of scholars that we all have going at OSC Marion because it's small enough with our class size to be able to sort of get people into a circle and talk and have conversations and debate and have sort of intellectual uh, socializing in some sense. Um, so I do find that for students that are, are much more comfortable in smaller class sizes, um, more intimate formats where you're, you know, you're sitting around talking in a circle. I always call sometimes my upper level classes or a glorified book club, you know, um, where you do have to write papers, but you know, there's a lot of conversation going on. 
And some students learn really well that way, right? Other students really prefer that lecture. And, you know, we have a little bit of everything on this campus to be able to sort of make uh, history majors happy with the major, but it is important to know that they will get a chance to have that sort of real face-to-face -face discussions with faculty um, who are right there and are, you know, Amanda's right across the, the, the hallway from me and Jim's next door to me and the English faculty are just down the hallway. And so there's, there's a really nice sort of sense um, that students are paid attention to. We know what their writing is we know what they're you know they're, how they're and we always say but my gosh you know can you imagine joe or can you imagine angie or whatever you know we knew her freshman year look at what she's doing senior year right i mean we get that so that that's sort of something that i think benefits students um at osu marion yeah and then you know just Picking up on that uh, from Margaret, I mean, that is one of the advantages is that we do have the smaller class sizes usually, um, and there is a much more connected uh, relationship with the students. And when, by the time you get to the 4,000 level, uh, you probably will have taken every class that we've offered over four years. So we kind of know what, what you've done and what your interests are and, and can kind of, you know, it, it's like an unfolding project that just culminates in that in that senior year. And it's it's quite nice. It's, it's something that you don't get in a much bigger, more anonymous environment. Uh, and since we do work together, I mean, I had a, a student who completed a, a thesis uh, several years ago, but she uh, was, you know, interested in African history, but also interested in anthropology. And so on the committee was our anthropologist on the Marion campus. And so we, you know, we do work across these disciplines. Uh, mm -hmm. There are no barriers, as Margaret said. Uh, and, and the same thing happened with film studies. I teach African cinema on the Marion campus. I'm the only one in the OSU system that teaches African cinema. So this is the place where you get that. Uh, but we have other faculty in English and other departments that also teach film. Uh, and so we kind of realized one semester that there were all these film classes being offered at the same time. It's like, wait a minute, if a student took all of these classes, they could pretty much have most of the minor done in or major in film studies. And so why not just organize officially the major in film studies? And so uh, so we cross that way, too. So uh, so there are a lot of options. It, it's a very rich environment, uh, very unique, despite our size. Mm -hmm. Amanda, did you want to add any more? Or? I just want to add, um, as a newcomer myself, what a positive um, experience it is to interact with everyone throughout the Marion campus. So within the history department, but everyone to, you know, the face you see at the front desk, you know, when you walk in, it is a very uh, happy place to be. And I think that's worth mentioning for anyone who is considering joining the club. That's just about all that we have. So thank you uh, for listening to us. And if you uh, have any questions, go ahead and uh, contact us through email. We'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Outstanding. Well, thank you all so much for sharing your expertise, your research, and your program ultimately with our students. I know I certainly enjoyed listening to everything you had to share. And I uh, just wanted to mention CSI Marion, we should make this a thing. <laughs> we should get some people involved in that. It sounds fun. <laughs> Um, but again, thank you all for joining us tonight um, for our Professor Poppins with the History Department and go Bucks. Thank you all. Thank you.